trust you always have a column for the intercept. The intercept column is trivial. It's simply a column of plus decisions. And I'm not going to write out the A, B, A, C, and B, C columns over here as T. Yes, it's simple. Now, what you notice, however, up there is there's a pattern developing. If you compare the column of C to the column of AB, you'll notice that those two columns are identical to each other. That's no surprise because, in fact, we had generated C by saying C is equal to A times B. So, absolutely no surprise at all that that is columns are identical. But we also notice that the AC column, minus, minus, plus, plus, matches the column for B, minus, minus, plus, plus. Similarly, you'll also notice that the BC column, minus, plus, minus, plus, matches the A column. And the intercept column, plus, 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 matches the ABC column. So, we're immediately concerned about this because it's telling me that the pattern for A, minus, plus, minus, plus, matches exactly the same pattern as we see, minus, plus, minus, plus. And we call that the confounding pattern. In other words, the confounding pattern tells me which columns are the same. And the interpretation of that confounding pattern is that the BC interaction cannot be told apart from the A main effect. Similarly, the second row of B equals AC, the interpretation of that is that the AC two-factor interaction cannot be told apart from the B's main effect. C main effect cannot be told apart from the A B C, uh, from the A B interaction. And similarly, the A B C effect, that three-factor interaction is going to be wrapped up into the intercept. So that's the interpretation of that. In other words, that's what we pay. That's our cost for running half the number of experiments. You don't ever get away with anything. You do less work, you pay less money, but the price you pay is you will not be able to tell these factors apart from the others. Now, it may not be a big deal. You may go into the experiment knowing quite well that that BC interaction doesn't exist. In many cases, we approach our engineering systems with pretty good prior knowledge, knowing that certain interactions don't exist. So if BC really was not an issue and it does not exist, then it doesn't matter. You're still going to estimate the effect of A. You can make similar arguments for the AC interaction and the AB interaction. So what experimenters do, in fact, is before they even run their experiments, is they generate this table and they check what they're going to lose before they even do any experiment. Okay. And when I said at the start of the session, when I worked with companies and higher students on this, we spent maybe five, six hours planning our experiments. It's because we spent five, six hours looking at various combinations of confounding patterns to find a confounding pattern that is going to cause the least problems before we even go ahead and run the experiment. We do so much work prior to even running the first experiment so that when you go run the very first experiment, experiment you can't waste any money. Okay, so a lot of investigation of the confounding pattern needs to be done. And our class today is we're going to look at how you might figure out what that confounding pattern is for more complex experiments. Here it's, it's so trivial, I can easily generate this table and I can look which columns are the same. I can find that quite easily. But remember, this is for a case where we've got three factors, A, B, and C. So the line up here, you're probably one of the most simplest types of experiments. That's quite manageable to do that by hand. But the moment you go to four, five, or more factors, you really can't be going and eyeballing an Excel spreadsheet finding which columns are the same as another one. Okay. 
So we need a more efficient approach that will tell us what the coins are going to be the same. Let me also just show this to you mathematically. Some of you might interpret it more from an algebraic point.
And to do that, let's go back several slides back, up to 50, slide 50, I think it is, where we were looking at the C2S interaction. So we'll go right back earlier to this three-factor example, where we've done a set of experiments where we call three factors, which are called C, T, and S, and we've done the full factorial. So all eight experiments were done, in fact. And when we did the analysis in R, we calculated this, this B squares model. There's an intercept plus a coefficient of C, T, and S. The C, T interaction, C, S, and the T, S interaction, as well as the C, T, S, P factor interaction. And I've given you some code on the website several days ago, and I showed it to you in class 12, where you can visualize those coefficients. And that code, when you run it, will generate a plot as follows. Okay, where we can see that the S interaction is significant, the CS two-factor interaction is significant, the C interaction is definitely significant. But these ones over here are not significant. What you notice is we've calculated seven slopes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven bars, plus an intercept. We never show the intercept. And the intercept is really almost never of any interest to us. So we drop it off. So here, here's the remaining seven factors I've calculated. And in the assignment you just handed in today, you showed that when you analyze the data from a design experiment, you've got no degrees of freedom. Your standard error is zero, and with standard error is zero, you cannot calculate confidence in Well, how can you? Get degrees of freedom back. You can get degrees of freedom back in two ways. One way is you can take those eight experiments and you can go repeat them all a second time. So let's just think what we've done there. We've said that the degrees of freedom is equal to n minus k. In this case, n is 8, and we've estimated 8 coefficients. So I've got 0 degrees of freedom. Well, what I'm saying is, what if you do 16 experiments? So you repeat all your experiments a second time. Now you've got 16 data points minus your eight parameters. Now you've got eight degrees of freedom. You will calculate the standard error, and you can go calculate confidence intervals. But another way that you can get degrees of freedom is by manipulating k. So rather than increase n, you might consider reducing k. And one way you can reduce k is by dropping out coefficients that are not important or not significant. So right away, the CTS, the CT, and the TS two-factor interaction, there's three experiments that you, uh, sorry, three slopes that you really don't need to estimate. Because relative to the main effects of these two-factor interactions here, those three guys down there are small. Those slopes are, are not affecting the system. Okay? So we can go drop them out of the experiments. Out of, sorry, out of the least squares model, I should say. Yes. We did all eight experiments. Oh. Yeah. yeah. We're coming back to this prior example where we did all eight. So we've done all eight experiments, we've calculated these full set of slopes. We were looking at them and say those three are small, let's drop them right out. So in R, then you go and you say to say in your R software, go refit your model without those coefficients. So let me call this my, my subset model. Model sub is now C plus T plus S plus the CS2 factor interaction. So simply draw out the remaining three coefficients. And summary of what sub shows you that you now have Three degrees of freedom for the R squared is still great, the standard error is 27. And you can go look at these coefficients, they're all significant. C is significant, S is significant, and C S is significant. You can also calculate confidence intervals. So use the conf int function sub. And it shows me that C is very much significant. This interval does not span zero. <coughs> T is the only coefficient that's marginally insignificant. 
Notice the asymmetry of that down. Minus 0 0.04 to plus 1.5. So t is insignificant, but we'll retain it nevertheless. And the reason why I would retain this coefficient in this experiment is because perhaps I just didn't vary temperature over, two, over a wide enough range. Right? Think of it this way. The temperature effect, let's say, unknown to me, I don't know the truth, but unknown to me, temperature has that effect on y. So this is a plot of y, my predicted y, sorry, my y itself, against temperature. I may have chosen to do my design experiment at that lower bound and that upper bound. So if I do my experiment at that lower bound and upper bound, unless I have really great instrumentation and can measure those two y values very accurately, I'm never going to know that this effect is significant. But I may have noise in my system which means I'm going to estimate values slightly above and below the reality. So to me, not knowing that this purple trend is the truth, I might actually estimate T as a flat line, or even the slight negatives, depending on the error in Y. Now, if you take your lower bound and upper bound further and further apart, so there's my lower bound and there's my upper bound, then you're going to estimate the significance coefficient. So this is why we like to retain coefficients that are just barely insignificant, because it might be that we simply not stretch the lower level and the upper level of my design experiment far enough apart. Okay. S is still significant, we can see that, and this is two factors. So now I've gained three. Okay, so 
the approach that I follow and that's recommended is we work your way up from the bottom. So A, B, we don't need, E, D, we don't need, C, D, A, B, C, and the four factor interactions are almost never significant. A, C, D, A, B, C, B, C, B, C, D, and then here you stop. Right? You, don't, you generally don't want to eliminate a main effect. If you're eliminating a main effect, it's telling you quite clearly the fact that you introduced, that you even experimented with in the first place, is not significant. So it's a pretty big deal to drop out a main effect. Okay. So what I would do is I would drop out all of those up to B, refit the model at that point, and then check the confidence interval. Is that clear? Yes. Why would you not draw a why do you not use C and BCD BC and BCD. Yeah. These are these are very small interactions. If you were if you were sure that BC, maybe you went into this experiment thinking BC will be there, will be a significant two-factor interaction. You don't have to drop out BC. Remember, you can drop out everything below BC, refit your model up to that point, and check the confidence. So let me use 
this idea here. I'd say my generator is equal to D is A, B, C. That says that D is an alias for A, B, C. So the fact that D is an alias for the A, B, C three factor expression is another way of saying it. And we get that generated from the table. Now what if I go multiply both sides of that equation by D? Can I say D times D is equal to A, B, C, D? And then I go multiply, or simplify that, I should say D times D is I,
time, multiply the length by i, i is my first part of my defining relationship. The next part of my defining relationship is a, b, c, d, so that says a, b, c, d, three times a, b, and simplify it to a, a, which I cancel out, b, b, which I cancel out, and c, b, remains. So a, b is a less than c, b, the b, c, d, three factor interaction. Notice that that just takes you right back to the very first one. A is A is for BCD, BCD is A is for A. So it's always a symmetrical relationship between your A and C. Okay, so that's a really quick way to find which columns in your X transpose X matrix, sorry, the X matrix are the same as the other columns using this very simple mathematical structure. Okay, now if you go at home, please try the following. Go back to this 2 to the 3 minus 1 example. In other words, go back to this case that we looked at over here. Find the defining relationship for that experiment and prove that you get those same confounding factors using that approach. Okay, so that's, that's your goal to try out. That's, that's uncertain before we move on to the next few slides. So for your experiments that, uh, that you'll be doing this over the coming week and then next week, you'll be using these defining relationships and generators to find in your fractional factorial designs what factors are endless with which. And that's going to be important to use when you interpret. Most of your report is in fact not on how you set up the experiment. Most of your report is going to be on the analysis of the data. And to do that analysis effectively, you need to know what confounding factors are when you interpret your mean squares models. Okay, so this will help in that interpretation. Let's take a look now, and this perhaps answers Kyle's question earlier, is where, where you start um, with some of these experiments. Well, there's many and what I argue is that this point that I'm going to show you now is where you should start your experiments. In fact, when I teach this, I'm teaching it to you the wrong way around. The full factorial model is almost never where you should start. It's extremely wasteful. You spend a lot of money and time doing a full factorial, and there's very little benefit to it. A full factorial is where you should end off your experiments. Then you go to a half, uh, you would have done a half fraction prior to that. Where you start off is actually at this point. But there's no good in teaching you this because you will, this will just confuse you. So we work, we're working backwards here, in fact. Where you start is you always want to start, when you come to a new system, you always want to do the least work possible. Right? We all have that goal in our lives generally. Do as little work as possible to get the most information. And what, the, what that means is, when you're looking at this table, it means you want to move up the table. You want to move as high up the table as you possibly can. You want to do the fewest number of experiments. Okay, well, if you only want to do four experiments, that's pretty much where you can go. You can't go anywhere else. If you want to do eight experiments, this table is telling you you can investigate three factors and do a full factorial, but I've already told you that that's wasteful. You can do, investigate four factors, five, six, and this is pretty powerful, you can investigate seven factors in eight experiments. That sounds kind of incredible because, remember, if you're taking seven factors, changing them from low to high, low to high, you're going to be able to tell whether those seven factors are important or not based on eight <coughs> experiments. How can we estimate eight things, seven, seven things from all the eight experiments? Well, it's what we call a very saturated design. In fact, you cannot investigate more factors than this. You cannot go to eight factors in the eight experiments. Seven factors is the, one, is the most number. And there's your four generators to generate the design. So what you'll go and do is, remember because there's eight experiments, you can go write a full factorial in factors A, B, 
a generator of full factorial with three factors, and then generate D, E, F, and G according to those rules. So let's take a look at this in this example. So it's a saturated design. We've got seven factors. It's a 2 to the 7 minus P factorial. And depending on what P is, P is either run the 64 experiments, <coughs> Every time you bump P up by one number, you move one row up. So you move up successively in the same column. So, sorry, you move it up the column. I should say you're moving along the row. So every time you bump P up, you're going from 3 minus 0, 4 minus 1, 5 minus 2, 6 minus 3, 7 minus 3. So you're moving along that row, retaining A. So how do you do it? Well, you've got your factors A, B, and C over there. Write them up in full factorial. That's your first step. The second step is setting factors D, E, and F. Those factors you use the generators on the table. And I've chosen to use the positive signs. D equals plus A, B, A, C, B, C, and A, B, C. You can use the negative signs. So you can go say minus D. And you can also go mix any of the signs up. So you don't have to choose all positives or all four. But our general approach is you almost always see people simply use the positive settings because it doesn't really make too much difference. So go generate D, E, F, and G. This table then is what you give to your operators or you go do yourself in your experiments at home. You go run those eight experiments setting those seven factors at the levels shown in this table. Okay, but now it's now it's where it gets messy. There's aliasing. There's going to be tremendous aliasing in this experiment. It's extremely messy aliasing. And what I'm going to show you next, I'm not going to pretend to write out to try and arrive because it's so so messy. So let's take a look at, at some of the rules. There's a new word I'd like to introduce. It's called the word. A word is simply one of these things over here. That's a word. ABC is a word. Um, any one of these, BCD is a word. A, B is a word. D is a word. Any one of these things in between the equal signs we call a word. And the rule is, we would like to know how many words are in our defined relationship. Well, it totally depends on what that P is. So remember this example I did on the board? This was for a 2 to the 4 minus 1. Okay, so P is equal to 1 in this case. K is equal to so in that experiment, 2 to the 4 minus 1, I have 2 to the power 1, 2 to the P words. There's my defining relationship. It has two words. I is the first word. The second word is A, B, C, B. How did I find that word? Let's just go back to the table. How did I find the word I said D is equal to A, B, C was the generator. Notice that's the generator. That's not the defining relationship. D equals ABC is the generator. The defining relationship is found by taking all combinations of the generators. Well, in this case, there's one trivial combination. It's D times ABC, which is ABC. You always get I. I is always your first word in your defining relationship. That one you don't have to think about. You always get I equals. In this case, there's only one combination of the generator D and ABC with each other, so you get ABC B over there. So there's your two words for this simple experiment. But as we move up this table, it's going to get messier and messier the more you move over to the right hand side. When you calculate the generator there, sorry, the generator, those are my four generators. Now I go take all combinations of the generators for themselves. Okay, 
Okay, so this is the mix. So we've got a 2 to the 7 minus 4 example here. We're going to look at this case of 2 to the 7 minus 4. So P is 4. So I'm going to have 2 to the 4 words, 16 words. Where do those 16 words come from? Well, here they are. Okay, and you can go try to write this at home. Let's take all my words two at a time. Well, let's take the first two. A, B, and D, and D equals A, C. So, A, B, D is my answer. A, B, D. So, A, B is equal to D. It's the product of that. E, A, C, F, D, that's your F, C, D, and A, B, C, D. Those are my words two at a time. Then I can go take, oh, sorry, that's the, that's, sorry, that's the generators one at a time, just, just simplify. Then I can go take those, those generators and take combinations two at a time. So take the first one, multiply by the second one, first one, multiply by the third one, first one, multiply by the fourth one. And you can calculate those combinations two at a time, three at a time, and then the final one is to combine and multiply all four generators. That gets you your 16 words over here, and that's your defining relationship. What I'd like to try at, at home before uh, Monday's class is try to find the confounding pattern here for factor A, and understand why A is confounded with those terms. I'll, I'll pick this up next class, but because it's so tedious and messy, this is something you should just 